<laughs> all right, thank you all. Um, so just me between the, the pub and you know, and the discomfort of the pub, so I'll be I'll be fast. Um, it'll be a quick and brutal takedown. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes. no, it's, it's 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 friendly, it's friendly, I promise. Okay, so Thank you all for making it on this beautiful Friday. Um, so on Tuesday, I introduced this problem of sameness and difference, right? So that, if, as you remember, it's the fact that any two things, actually existing things, are going to be different in innumerable ways. So this was just to make the kind of basic point that the sense of equality and difference that is referenced when we use variables and formalisms refer only to the particular variable abstractions, right? They don't refer to the thing in itself. This is a kind of basic point. They only refer to the data that we're capturing. And we don't care again about any senses of similarity and difference because those come cheap. When we do statistics and especially when we do causal inference, we care about similarity and difference in the right way along the relevant features for some task. So we have to make sure our variables are constructed in the right way to capture the right kinds of similarity and difference. And that was just the problem variable construction. And I was being a little bit cagey, Max asked these questions about observable and unobservables. And I was being cagey because it's not even clear to me what an unobservable is because for, you know, people they'll often make assumptions like um, the directionality of some sort of um, uh, what we have in our, in our observed variables. We can assume that, let's say, correlations will go in the same direction as we have uh, with respect to other observables. Sometimes they'll say they'll say things like that, um, and uh, you know, I guess the question is just I don't really even know what unobservables are. Are your things observed and unobserved? Well, it's just it's just that there are just like what do we mean by very like if you mean that there's a whole there's a total there's a real set of confounders out there, some of which I observe and some of which I do not observe. Then that that's that's you know I can get a grip on that better. But sometimes it's not clear whether they mean like the full set of components or just like all variables like in general, um, because you know I okay. But then even more restricted, are you okay with the set of observed variables and everything else? What what do you mean by oh everything we have in our data set? Everything we have in our data set. What about is that like a, a notion that you're okay with? Yeah, I mean that that's that's specific to a particular data set and the variables that are in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this was just, and this problem I said was is you know is a bit of a banal observation, but I think it's often neglected because oftentimes we just take for granted because we take off the shelf the data that we're working with and we think oh that's going to capture the relevant senses of similarity and difference that's apt for my aim of inquiry, uh, and then we're off the statistical races. And uh, what I, today I don't want to do is I don't want to jump in and begin arguing about whether and in what cases data and variables do capture the relevant notion of similarity and difference. I'll eventually argue about that. But first, I want to draw out what the variables are that are being used in particular setups. And I'll be talking about audit studies because those are the clearest to see. So the first is just like, what are the notions of similarity and difference that are being used in certain studies? So what are the variables that lie behind or rationalize a certain kind of experimental setup? And then only after that can we ask whether those variables are good or bad ones, right? So the, this is kind of a two-step. The first thing is, what are the variables that are being used? And second is like, are those good for the conclusions that we're drawing about the setup? And when I'm doing the second thing where I'm evaluating whether variables are good or bad, Remember, goodness or badness is a question of fit. It's a question of fit to the task or the aim of the inquiry or the conclusion that you want to draw. So I don't want to say that there's kind of goodness or badness about variables, like as such. They'll just be for the aim of inquiry, but sometimes I'll just say good or bad. Uh, so the first step is to figure out what the variables are. The second step is to figure out what they seem to be fit to the study or not. Uh, really quickly. Okay, so this inquiry into variable construction is, is easiest to see in experimental setup. So I'll be talking about audit studies because in an experiment, the the that's a case where the, the researchers are constructing the variables themselves in some sense, right? They're trying to test for something by doing something. And so they kind of get to collect the data that they want to collect or, or they, they end up collecting data that they want to collect. 
And so it's it's easier to see in experimental settings, I think, the notions of similarity and difference and the variables that people think will be apt for their task. And that's why I'm looking at experimental setups. I hopefully um, they'll be clearer, but you can think in a you know, randomized controlled trial when we're trying to achieve matching and we're trying to do the stratified randomization, what I'm doing is I'm clustering like people by age and then I'm randomizing or I'm clustering people by whatever relevant covariate and then I'm randomizing. So that seems to indicate that the researcher thinks that age is relevant. They think that sex is relevant and so on. So experimental setups are a good way of just identifying the variables that people take to be. Um, in that case, relevant means predictive of the outcomes. I think both. Yeah, yes, predictive of the outcome. So they think that age is going to be predictive of the outcome in some way. They're worried that if I didn't do that, then something, you know, I might risk uh, age imbalance, let's say, in my experiment. And that would be bad for my um, drawing conclusions. This is work with the incomparable Issa Kohler Hausman. She's at the law school at Yale. She's also a sociologist. This is a project that has been ongoing for years, but still nonetheless. It has a lot of kinks to work out, and so I'd be really grateful for your feedback. We're on the frontier. We're on the frontier here. Okay, so we're turning to social scientific audit and correspondence studies. Does everyone remember what these are? They're these studies where I construct, basically, it's a quasi-experiment, quasi-natural setup where I construct resumes or whatever kind of um, stimulus that's going to be matched in some respects and different in another respect. The thing across which they are different is the treatment, or we're gonna problematize this, but that's the cause under study. The thing that is um, constructed to be the same is going to be kind of my way of controlling the conditions of my experiment. So this is, again, the famous um, Bertrand Monathan 2004 study. So these studies are often used in economics, but also sociology and political science across now a lot of the social sciences to do a particular thing, which is proper evidence of discrimination along some characteristics. So the, this one was famously used to get the um, racial discrimination in the labor market, but they've been used to find to, to proper evidence for sex discrimination or discrimination along a number of different categories of interest. And I, if you'll remember, I had this slide up before where I wanted to point out this question of different treatment and otherwise identical characteristics in similar circumstances is going to be the, the the phrases that we'll be scrutinizing today. Now, I, a quick interlude, which is whether this is a reasonable approximation of the legal or moral notion of discrimination. I'm not going to really get into the, the nitty gritties of legal interpretation. What I do want to say is that it's not completely unfounded. Like It's not like social scientists made this up. First of all, here they are saying it's the gold standard for documenting discrimination. It's a central tool in anti-discrimination research is that, you know, so it's, it's not just these two esteemed uh, economists, it's many people besides, and it's even our favorite, our, the notorious Pearl says the same thing. He's saying here, it's, you know, it's a causal counterfactual question. And certainly this view about discrimination as in the mode of causal counterfactuals is also vindicated by the Supreme Court itself. So this is not like, again, this is just to kind of bolster up this position that there is this perceived close link between discrimination, the legal notion, the moral notion, and the causal notion. Um, so again, it's a counterfactual question, what would have happened to a non-white individual if he or she had been white? Or, you know, we have to say to prevail, a plaintiff must plead and ultimately prove that but for race, that's a causal, but for causation is a standard of causation, that this, that bad thing wouldn't have happened. Okay, so that's just to get that um, out of the way. So I pointed out this causal standard, though, which what I called interventionism, because that's the kind of conceptual core of this notion, requires a prior notion of all else equal sameness and difference, and that's where the problem of variable construction rears its head. Yeah. A little bit of a, seems a little bit of a funny example to, to pick in terms of talking about causal inference, because it's kind of at the margin of what many people would consider legitimate causal inference. Um, is it the margin of what people, who people? Not these people. The Fair gold enough. standard. People it's a like central it. tool. It's a causally rigorous analysis. <laughs> so I mean, maybe may, social scientists. These are social scientists. <laughs> these are social scientists. This is like the National Academy of Science social science report. 
Like, I mean, this guy, look at this guy. He's this a scientist. I mean, not really, he's a scientist or whatever. I don't really know what he is. He's like a computer scientist. Um, so, so autosites are frequently, maybe you, maybe this is, I would say maybe it's fallen out of favor, except for the fact that everywhere I look, QJE is publishing the largest auto study of all time. Sorry. I guess what I'm saying is not that audit studies have fallen out of favor, but the claim that that you can say and say treat race as a causal variable, right? Something that I think many people would not subscribe to. But certainly, if the if, if okay, so then there's the question of what the audit studies are doing. So maybe you're saying the audit studies are not treating race as a causal variable. Is is that what you would yeah, say? Yeah, like the, the type of statements which treat like everything apart for race, so like this this quote here, right? Yeah, you're saying this is this this is a minorized position. Marginal position. I don't know if this was in a typical labor economics seminar, say, or. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what other people think, but um, in my, I think that a lot of the work, and maybe it's fallen out of favor in economics, but certainly it's the case that like super high, um, status political science and sociology journals that continue to, you know, they they talk about it. They're careful. But they use DAGs with race all the time, and 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 the things that are in DAGs are eligible to be causes by the DAG framework, right? I guess maybe as a, a I'm interested, sort of, and is is there a distinction to be drawn here? I mean, I think sort of this evidence, and I mean, just continuing practice very much, including in economics, I do think points to people continuing to accept audit studies as evidence of discrimination. Yeah. Right. And, and sort of as like, in some sense, ideal evidence of discrimination. Yeah. Like, or cleanest evidence, available evidence of discrimination. So, yeah. Applicable. And I guess I'm interested in is that um, sort of, Max, would you do, do you think there's a distinction between that and people accepting them as sort of fully causal? Or, and also, sort of, Lily, for you, does it matter which of the, like, yeah, totally. You can sort of either of those work for your purposes? I mean, my, my guess would be if you get to go to like a random applied metrics course in the typical credit program, the examples of causal variables with see as things like you know, job training programs or stuff like that, where it's obvious there's a policy intervention that changes it. Yeah. Whereas um, when when people start talking about discrimination in the mainstream way, they, they maybe have notions like taste-based discrimination in mind, which is is there a way that you could behave differently where your profits would be higher? Yeah. Um, but that's a different question from um and it's not, oh, not yeah. stated in terms of race being the cause of variable yeah but i guess but for in the context of an audit study right i guess there's a so there's a, so one thing is the name on the top of an audit study feels like very much like the like sort of a classic treatment. example yeah. of treatment that you could use in a in a thing and then there's a then there's this more slippery debate of you call changing the rate changing sort of the racial affiliation of the name on the top of a resume, do you call that sort of that treatment race or do you call that name? Yeah, good. Yes, so we will get into all of this deliciousness very shortly. But I guess what I would wanna say is that people take audit studies to be evidence of discrimination because they take them to be the gold standard of causal evidence. That's what I think is happening. So you go, audit studies proffer evidence for causation and via causation, because we know discrimination is a causal notion, they proffer evidence for discrimination. And that's why critiques of audit studies always aim to undercut methodologically whether they in fact achieve the causal isolation task, right? That's what Heckman says. He's like, actually, here's the thing. There are all these unobservables that you're not accounting for in the interview or whatever other information that the uh, employer has. And those are actually what is causally responsible for the divergence in the outcomes. That's meant to methodologically undercut the causal claim that it's the name or whatever, that it's the, um, and, and via the undercutting methodologically, you get the undercutting of the normative claim that it's evidence of discrimination. I think what Ekman then has in mind is just saying, oh, you're, you're claiming these companies on the profit maximizing, but they really are profit maximizing. He has a number. They are good. Yeah, I mean, he has a number of critiques that go in all sorts of directions, but there's a strand of his critique that clearly tries to undercut them as causal studies. And thereby undercut them as discrimination studies. Yes. Um, two questions. Firstly, am I right that but for is, is really a prevalent term of art? In it's not mm -hmm. just score such on this particular occasion we use the. the yes, but for is a is a standard of causation. Right. Yeah. And it, it basically corresponds to the interventionist conception, which is that a change race 
but for a change race, but I leave everything else as is. I was supposed to ask about differential impact, which came up uh, yesterday, I think, which yes. seems to bypass this by just requiring, am I right? It's sort of- Yes. If, disparate, so in the US discrimination law, there's two, two there's basically two strands in doctrine. There's disparate impact and disparate treatment. Disparate impact, just legally speaking, is only in statutory law, so it's not protected in equal protection. So equal protection, which is the, the big 14th Amendment constitutional guarantee, um, so claims brought under that are going to be constitutional claims to equal protection. Those only are in, in voice in, the, in disparate treatment. Disparate impact is has a position in law under Title VII, under various titles in the Civil Rights Act. So they're statutory law, so they're obviously still law. Um, as many claims have come under them, but if you are praying, bringing forth an equal protection claim, which a lot of big discrimination claims are, you cannot make a disparate impact argument. And you don't need to show the, what I'm talking about is going to be like more in the mode of disparate treatment. I don't know whether that's what makes me proud or not, but I wanted to express my, why I feel uncomfortable with this, like yeah. race as a cloud variable. It seems that the real thing that we say here is that when we show somebody two situations yes. in which the only difference is this one thing we have changed, then they behave differently because they attribute that difference only to race. Yes. I think that's different as saying, I have like all the variables that makes up a human and I can intervene on race. Yeah, good. So I would just distinguish those two things because yes. Yes. the fact that we can write it in a DAC to me doesn't mean that it's sensible to intervene on it. Yeah. Um, yes. So I mean, it's like I, I think what we narrowly say is that it's that difference that, yeah, that difference um, signal like means that the causes through through race. But it's like the, the fact that we hope this. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. So so you when I go when I press forward, you'll tell me whether this is sympathetic with what you're saying or at odds with it. Um, so certainly, it's the case that. A bunch of debate has been raging for decades about the status of race as a causal variable. Some people have no problem with just putting it in a DAG, such as here. Um, but other people do. Did I actually touch it? Okay. Other people have more of a problem and they want to say things like uh, a racialized name or a racialized stimulus or the perception of race, uh, a signal of it, you know. So they're more distanced, perhaps. Um, because there are a lot of problems that people have, for instance, with localizing treatment to a particular time, being able to identify pre and post treatment. These are like very important in causal inference, but are difficult to conceptualize as uh, race treatment. Um, so like the, the popular move is to go from, I treat the individual to like, I treat the decision maker with a perception that is localized because well, it can be localized, yes. It's maybe just to rephrase what I was trying to say initially, yes. it's just there are two two things you could do. One is criticize um, mainstream causal inference, one is criticize audit studies. Both are interesting. I think of those two as two different things. Yeah, good. Yes. So I think I so I'm using audit studies as an example because as I said yesterday, I think that what undergirds modern contemporary causal inference practice is the same interventionist idea. I think audit studies are a clean illustration of the problem. And hopefully we can translate the lessons to be learned in that a cleaner illustration back to even more mainstream, more um, sophisticated causal influence. I don't even think of more sophisticated, right? But it is, I don't know, say we study a job training program. And yeah. Like there are many things we talked about that are driving to the job center. Good. Yes. Yes. Think, well, whatever, being out of the home. Yes. Yeah, so there's also, maybe, yeah, there's also a question about whether the critique only applies to these kinds of social, complicated social statuses but but those are cases where there is a clear package intervention that i might be talking about maybe and better there it's true yes so so i think that what will carry over is that question whether it's clear what the intervention is because a lot of what i'll say i think will apply to cases where it looks like it's clear like giving someone a cash transfer of x dollars and i think some of what i will say might apply to those cases too but we'll see i mean we'll see how how sympathetic you guys are feeling today. Okay, so remember I, I made this point about different and same. I really quickly glossed over that. And today we're gonna look into, like we're really gonna investigate this, this claim that this is what in fact audit studies are doing. Okay, 
So I'm going to go through three interpretations, possible interpretations that will reveal the underlying variable structure that rationalizes audit studies. Okay. So the question, you can think of these in many different ways. I'm thinking them of them. I'll give them all to you and you can tell me which one sticks. One way of thinking about it is what are the variables that the experimenters have in mind that generate this experimental design that they draw conclusions from? Another way of thinking about it is what are the notions of similarity and difference that the audit study design is supposed to operationalize? Another way of thinking about it is what assumptions are being made about what correct treatment and incorrect treatment are. Those are all ways of getting a grip on this question. I'm going to go through three interpretations of what audit studies could be, could be studies of which correspond to three different sets of assumptions, correspond to three different variable constructs, and I'm going to use the potential outcomes framework to talk about all of them. So the first one, interpretation one, is, it, and so I have names for these. The first is the retreat, which is that the study is a study design of presenting stimulus one, blob one, stimulus blob two on some behavior, callbacks. That's going to be the retreat. Again, these are course things. There are many of these, but like think of these as like types of interpretations where what you're trying to do is impose as minimal assumptions as possible about what constitutes proper treatment in the study. Okay, so this is the one you can, Isaiah had brought up this possible interpretation. The, it's a causal, causal effect of me telling my researchers to go out there in the field and do this action. Okay, that's the retreat. The second interpretation is what I call the mixed treatment. This one is that the study is going to give us the causal effect of perceiving different race atop the resume, but perceiving the same job, the same job experience education, the same formal credentials under the, under the name. I'll, I'll, I'll say why that's mixed because I'm going to contrast it with interpretation number three, which is that if the study is giving the causal effect of perceiving different race and perceiving a different notion of same, same job experience. And let me tell you what the difference between these two sames are. The third interpretation, I'm perceiving the same productivity level, the same meaning of the qualification. So that's why it's called the Becker, because that's what Becker is, is thinking of. He's thinking of taste space as cases where we have full information and the employers know that the productivity levels of these candidates are matched. What makes it taste space is that I'm nevertheless experiencing a penalty. So I'm calling this one the, the Becker because I'm assuming that when I read the same credentials, I perceive same substantive human capital level, productivity level. This conception of same is just that I'm reading the same words. I'm not assuming anything about perceived human capital or productivity level. So that's why I'm calling it mixed. It's mixed because I am perceiving something substantive race, but I'm not perceiving something substantive productivity level. I'm not assuming anyway. So each of these interpretations makes sense how they're distinct. So walk through each of them I'm gonna in more detail, and then we'll talk about what um what conclusions they license okay so it's the retreat the mixed treatment and the backer okay so the retreat the retreat here the only assumption that's being made is the two different treatments are different insofar as the stimuli are different okay so there's no assumptions about being made about the meanings attached to the stimuli i can't even say it's a resume i'm just saying it's a page that someone receives proper treatment here doesn't even um, require that the resume reader internalize a particular kind of information because it's a full retreat, right? I'm not even assuming that the resume reader reads the resume, like the resume reader could eat the resume and that would count as treatment, right? And this is important because in, so this is a bit like the potential outcome of blob one minus blob two, okay? No assumptions are being made about the content of the resume. I'm not distinguishing the, the same part of the resume or the different part of the resume. I'm just saying they're blobs. Yes. I, I just, uh, just a proposal how you could still see this as constructed. Yes. Um, would be uh, to say, okay, you got two, we saw two different stimuli and we something really changed. Yeah. And now we're done with statistics and we're done with the philosophy. Yeah. Let's just talk about the common sense of what we think it was. Yeah. The change. Yeah the outcome totally or maybe not even the direction of the outcome you know just just learn something about a significant variable yes people. yes i i agree with that i think that if you're willing to do that though then why not put out the assumptions from the outset 
which in other words, I think that if you're willing to do this and then later be like, oh, I think it was probably the name. It means that what you were probably really testing for was something like the mixed treatment. But so, but I, I, I totally take that on board. So really quickly, and I'm not saying this is bad. I just want to do this for every single one of the interpretations so we can see the, the different, the range of possibilities here. Okay, so here are some problems about, yes. Just the, key, the blob, is it more about cognitive bias than this? Uh, um, no, it's, I don't mean, I, I just mean blob as in just like, a, I just mean like, I, I really want to make as few assumptions about what would be um, successful treatment as possible. What would be successful treatment is just that I, I gave you the resume for, or I gave you this, this stimulus. Yes. I mean, another way to think about the retreat is we don't stop at the retreat, but we first do the, do the retreat version, yeah. with agreement on that, and then yeah. we move on to how we interpret it, right? Kind of. Yes. So can you, so... So why don't we hold that thought and compare that to mixed, and you can tell me what the difference, what the um, practical difference is between the two step, the step where I start with retreat and then I do interpretation versus the one step, which is I just start with mixed. So I think because there's different yes. reasons you can fail. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. 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 This is the fifth. Version. Yes. Good. Uh, and good. then there's additional reasons you can fail at the later version. Yeah. Good. Totally. Great. That's really helpful. Okay, so here are some problems, again, preliminary problems. It's no longer about race, right? Because I just said it was blob one and blob two. I didn't want to make any assumptions about whether the blobs were being read, whether people could distinguish that like red was a white name and Jamal was a black name. Like I'm not making any assumptions about that. So it seems that I'm not licensed to say that the effect of whatever this is, blob one minus blob two, is going to be the effect of race. The second is there's a lack of connection between the stimuli. So for instance, we, we ran this study and we deliberately were like, oh, we got to make Greg and Jamal have the same education. But there was kind of no point in doing that if I'm just doing blob one and blob two. There's kind of no rationalization for why I made the resumes identical in that respect if I'm not going to assume that even the, the person read that part of the resume. Um, okay. Okay. And the implication here is that any way that outcomes might vary across treatments counts as an effect of interest. Maybe Max wants to push on this. But the idea is, if I later found out that everybody who received the Greg resume like ate the resume, and everyone who received the Jamal resume like read it very carefully, I would be like, oh, looks like that's an effect. I guess people like to read or like to eat stimulus one. Um, and, and someone wouldn't say like, oh no, that was a failure of treatment. They would say, you know, again, it's conceptual here. They would say like, oh, I guess that, you know, that's weird. Does that make sense? Because in, in the potential, and oftentimes you want to make a distinction between intent to treat and treat. Uh, and the idea is oftentimes like in a medical context, I give you a pill and you don't take it. And I don't want your outcome, Anna, to still count when I'm trying to do analysis because the idea is that even though I, I meant to assign you to treatment, you didn't actually, you know. So there's a, there's a sense in which treatment could fail. Uh, but because they're making, I'm not making any assumptions about that here, um, there is no such real distinction. Um, I have to kind of incorporate that data as a, uh, that response as a part of it. Another way to say it, though, there is the distinction is there, but I'm just um, estimating the reduced form of intent to treat and then and move on. Yeah, good. Yes, yes, yes. So this is what you're, you're you keep going for this. Okay. Okay. Mixed treatment. First, I want to say that I think that this is. I think I think this is the. A lot of a lot of how people interpret causal studies, which is appears that they're they're after the following construct contrast. Uh, I'm differing in very sensitive. <laughs> I'm differing in perception of race. <laughs> That's Vanna White perception of, uh, perception of race, but I have the same high school degree. So HSD is high school degree. HIS so BW okay indicates perception of black perception of white. HSD indicates perception that the candidate has met the formal requirements of obtaining a high school degree. So high school degree, technical experience, and so on. Okay, so let's just walk through that really slowly. So here's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming the resume reader is reading Greg. Okay, I'm perceiving the candidate to be racial as white. I'm reading education high school diploma from Berkeley High School. I'm reading, I'm assuming that the decision maker perceives a candidate they believe to have met the formal requirements of getting a high school degree from Berkeley High. Same thing with the Jamal case. 
I'm not assuming, remember, this is what distinguishes interpretation two from interpretation three, the Becker. I'm not assuming that when I read high school degree, that there's that this generates any specific impression regarding productivity, level of human capital, or any other indicia of merit. Because that would be that would be in, in interpretation three. I'm just, I guess I'm just assuming that I believe the candidate to have achieved this formal credential. Now, the reason why we think that this is a the effect that a lot of researchers seem to be going after is sometimes researchers will say this in their when they're describing the results they're out of say they're saying part of the effect that we're trying to test for is whether a decision maker is devaluing right the education credential on a black resume so you'll see something like so for instance in the Bertrand Mullen thing to say they're going through reasons they say oh we might have expected improved credentials to alleviate the fear that they're deficient right so the idea is like oh i'm supposed to be using information about the um i'm supposed to be perceiving something specific. i'm supposed to be seeing i mean is a kind of a better example of this is how in, in this actual study they use high and low there's uh two um, arms of it there's high quality resumes and low quality resumes and one of the conclusions they draw I mean, one of the findings that's even more remarkable in this original study is that there's basically no return to skill. Jamal experiences basically very little return to skill, even when his resume improves. And they offer this hypothesis, which is that the, the credentials being devalued in the high resume arm. So, so, the, so it just seems like they're going with something like this, right? The idea is um, it looks like the use of the name is kind of informing the perceived productivity level. So even though it says high school degree, I'm devaluing it. So even though it's um, college degree, I'm devaluing it. Okay. But at this point, you're at the level of effect at originality rather than at the level of confounders. Or... Well, it, it would depend on how you're conceiving of the causal estimate, right? So it's a confounder if you're trying to isolate those, but it's a, it's a it's heterogeneity if it's a part of the effect. So exactly what we're trying to ask is what the estimate is. I guess I'm just referring to this sentence here. But... Um, well, okay, so I guess part of the question is I, I don't really know because I can't tell from this passage alone what the estimate is an estimate of. Can can someone? I mean, at this point, they're cutting the data into uh, in different ways and estimating effects for subgroups. But right, effects because... of what? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's it's kind of a. A second stage question after the first stage question of asking for the overall effect of a racialized name. Right. I'm just saying it's like a conceptual slightly different thing. You know, I understand that. I guess I'm I understand this as a matter of I'm just doing cross tabs. I'm looking at this, you know, but insofar as this question about whether this is whether this can be called effect heterogeneity, I don't see how it can be called effect heterogeneity until I know what the effect is an effect of. For instance, if it's well, just effect, I mean, it's two numbers, and just, it's got to get those two numbers the same or not. Yeah, is that, this just, is that just the same as saying descriptive statistics wise, these two numbers are different? It's just, inter or it just, it just, is this the same as just saying like the percentage of callbacks within this arm of the experiment was this, and the, the percentage of callbacks in this arm of the experiments is that? Well, I guess in this case, the, the degree is also a manipulated variable, but it corresponds to say you run a medical trial and you ask what's the overall effect of the drug on average, and then you ask what's the effect for women, what's the effect for men, mm -hmm. right? And, but that, sorry, but that is consistent with the mixed interpretation, though, right? Because it's sort of saying the the uh, sort of bracketing whether it's sort of the perceived effect of race, it's saying the the effect of Greg versus Jamal was bigger in the was sort of going from the low high school to the high school high high sort of low to high quality resume groups does not change the estimated causal effect of Jamal versus Greg or did not lessen the estimated causal effect of Jamal versus Greg so it is I guess yeah. I'm, I'm not sort of is what you're saying inconsistent with the like it's not even just I was just trying to clarify oh, okay. that there one is just, is a question of do we hold everything relevant constant to isolate the effect of yeah. Race. Uh -huh. That's one question. The other yeah. one is: Is the effect of race different depending on what else holds true? For yeah, good. Whatever. Okay. 
Yes, yes. I think I think that we are not at, at loggerheads. But let me, I want to go one more slide and then we can go back to this. Okay. So, okay, so, so now we're going to get a little bit more complicated, which is we're going to look at this notation. And this notation seems to indicate the two versions of the unit differ only in terms of perceived rates, right? That's just what the notation indicates. But what I want to do is I want to problematize this notation because if I'm not, if it's a part of the mixed treatment that I'm not assuming that the decision maker is perceiving the same meaning, I'm not, I'm not assuming that they're perceiving the same human capital level, let's say, then I want to say that this notation is not justified. And this is some a, 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 almost like a technical term art that Tyler Vanderweel uses when he says, when he talks about these consistency violations and potential outcomes. And so in, a, in, the, in the potential outcomes framework, you have a consistency violation when you have a treatment that's oftentimes said to be not well-defined because there are different versions of the treatment that generate maybe what Max is saying, effect heterogeneity. Like a significant kind of effect on heterogeneity that we, without, to an extent where we want to undercut the validity of the causal estimate. So we, he often uses BMI as an example. So BMI, if there are two versions of the treatment, one version of lowering my BMI is I cut off my arm, and one version of lowering my BMI is I get liposuction, and another version is that I, I starve. I can't just say reduce BMI by five or like BMI equals 20 because there are two different, too many different versions of the treatment. And it constitutes a consistency violation because each of those versions of the treatment has a different effect on my potential outcome. So that's, so it's a little bit related to this effect heterogeneity. What's different is that the idea is that it's so different that I can't, I, I can't even call them like heterogeneous effects of BMI reduction because it just is not, it doesn't, we shouldn't even call that BMI reduction. It just, it undercuts its status as a cause in like in, in Toto. So he says that in, in these cases, the notation is not justified. There's also other ways of describing consistency violations. Um, one is that the outcome that you receive, the outcome that's observed equals the potential outcome that you would receive under the treatment that you in fact have. Um, to me, that's a little bit confusing, but um, the idea is I should be able to pick out the world in which you are in, the actual world that you're in, as exactly corresponding to a potential outcome on the treatment. So there, it shouldn't be variations across different possible worlds where you have the same treatment, in other words. Okay. So what I want to say is that if you have in mind this consistency violation, it seems like HSD, HSD is not justified. Because I'm assuming that you're not perceiving the same substantive meaning, right? So, so, here, so let's walk through. So now this is a revision of the interpretation. I read Greg, I assume that the person is white. I read high school diploma and I assume the decision maker perceives a candidate who is racialized white to have met the formal requirements of getting a high school degree. And, and same thing here. Okay, so remember, so what was important in, in interpretation two, the mixed treatment is I'm not perceiving something identical when I read a high school degree. I'm perceiving different kinds of productivity and I'm responding to productivity. I'm, I'm perceiving a white high school degree and a black high school degree, okay? So it seems like I need this assumption in order to account for the possibility that I'm devaluing the credential based on race. So it seems like this is a more apt way of putting the notation. Okay, so we'll let BHSD denote perception of a candidate who is racialized black having a high school degree and WHSD as perception of a candidate who is racialized white having a high school degree. Because I'm not assuming again that similarity in just the text is generating the same substantive meaning, then it seems like it's more apt to highlight that difference, the possible difference in perception of qualifications in the notation, because that's what's causally relevant. Yes. So I think I understand what you mean. But so you're just saying, so basically what the mixed treatment is saying is saying there might be a non-zero interaction that I'm observing. Yeah. But that sounds actually like the retreat in some sense. I thought it sounds like the mixed <laughs> 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 Because I thought the third one was that you 
see all the other qualifications in the light of the... No, the third one is that I perceive identical productivity level when um, I read high school degree. I Here, that. I'm not assuming identical productivity level. So I'm assuming white high school degree and black high school degree. So you can think of it as it's a kind of consistency violation. Um, but it, it's a little bit different because it's relationally defined with the first treatment. Um, yeah, Isaiah. So I guess something I don't... Yeah. Something that feels funny about this yeah, move good. is that these are not the I mean, these are now not separate separately manipulable. Totally right. Yes. Like in some sense, yes. right? Like what does it mean to say, yes. oh, I think this resume comes from a white person, yes. but I perceive their high school degree as if they were black, right? Yeah, like exactly. That, right. And so in some yes. sense, the the other version does sort of has like a clear, but in the context of the audit totally. study, has a clear manipulability connection, whereas this one yes. doesn't. Absolutely. And that's why I'm calling it mixed, because it just seems like I'm the, the two things are like mixing together. The the name treatment is mixing into the this treatment down here. And and it, you know, in consistency violations, oftentimes what you will do is you're gonna say you gotta apply the same treatment. Like you gotta both cut off their arms. But in this case, what you're pointing out is you can't. Yeah, but but I guess my I guess in some sense to me that actually would just makes me think I want to call the treatment the other right I sort of I want to call the treatment the thing I am showing to people right and basically the treatment consists of two pieces the name and the rest of the resume and then how people interpret the rest of the resume may be totally different but I I'm, I'm going to call that part of the potential outcome not part of the so those are not different versions of the treatment yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. okay so you want to say something like this. This is like what's on the page. Yes. Exactly. And then this is maybe also what's on the so right. So actually this is why we call it a mix is because when we when the treatment is perception of race, I'm not saying something about what's on the page. I'm right. saying exactly. what you're perceiving. Right. Yeah. And then here you want to move back to on the page. Or or sort of my my slit. I mean, my the version I the, my safe space is safe uh, space. Greg, comma HSD, Jamal, comma HSD. Yeah, good. Right. So that that's the version, and then it's in between retreat and this. And if I'm being if I'm being you know especially credulous, we could call that black comma HSD and white comma HSD. But like yeah, so it's in, it's a position of in between mix yeah. and blob. Right. So it's it's in between in the sense that you still want to just capture what's on the page. Yeah. Um, but it's more towards mix in the sense that you are making some assumptions, yeah. which is that there's a distinction that's being drawn right. between the name and the rest of the blog. That it's not just the people reading the rest. Of yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, for me, this like one way to read this book is to say, okay, we have causal evidence of racial discrimination. Yeah. Because if two resumes are treated differently between um, two cases where the most obvious difference is racial perception and it has a large difference then it could be that it's kind of the second or the third version, yeah. but both of them would be really fucked up. Totally. Because both of it would be a sign of racial discrimination. So I feel maybe as, as economists, at least I feel I have, it's like, it's hard for me to distinguish between those two because we try to write as if models. Like we're not really taking a stance about whether that's exactly the right way of what's going on under the hood. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of, for me, these are, I can't really use data to distinguish between those two. But I would say either way, it's like a bad sign for the racial discrimination. I mean, you can distinguish in the sense you can put more or less things on the C on the CV, right? It's right, right. So, so you want to have kind of enough CV that you think the first order thing is racial perception. But I think I'm just I'm just trying to play to your hand here by giving you, I think, the by the typical right? read, like no, the, the typical. <laughs> I, I think yeah. I kind of I think interpretation like for me, this is a really good framing of that the ambiguity between those two. Yeah, we probably want an interpretation. That is um, doesn't rely on the distinction distinction between those two. Okay. And I think saying yeah. causal causal evidence of discrimination, where evidence of discrimination is one part, and causal just means I've I've done something causally. Um, but the cause is not race. The causal part is I've cleanly identified this difference here. To me, that is kind of consistent with the relation to. But I, I'm not quite curious whether you. Think that statement it makes sense. I I I think you're so so the question so tell me if, so 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 maybe like what I mean is like is, is if I say oh this is like let's call this causal evidence for racial discrimination good. but not necessarily cause of race yeah good is that consistent in your yes. interpretation too yes totally 
what, and this is only going to come up when we begin to read critiques of Ada's studies. So part of like the lesson to be drawn about why this is fruitful, even if it's pedantic, is there are lots of methodological debates about whether an Ada study is correct or not. And the question is like, what's the standard of correctness? If that's that, what, 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 what should it be, A? Eh? But what, it, what are they aiming for? And it's hard to identify whether methodological debates even make contact if you and I are just disagreeing about the estimate of interest. So the point of raising these interpretations is that I think that a lot of methodological debates are not even making contact, not because people are saying, we agree on the estimate, but you did a bad experiment, or because you didn't control for confounder or blah, but because we in fact do not agree about our underlying estimate, but because nobody has been explicit about the similarity and difference about the variables and so on, it's been very difficult to identify that this is a key miscommunication in some sense. Um, one thing that might emphasize why you might need to distinguish them is that in the mixed treatments things, there might be justifications for some of the situations. Like assume in the rest of the resume there was, was the college, uh, was the leader of the college natural uh, NAACP mm -hmm. um, chapter. chapter. Yes. Now uh, that means a lot. That's that, yes. that that is very different on a white resume and a black resume. Yeah. Even though it is the same. So that's something where the sort of nonlinearity is obvious. Absolutely. Um, yes. And in, in a paper of mine, I, I do the same thing with them. Um, uh, if you read the classic odysseys of used car negotiations. They train the auditors, this is sex in used car sales prices. They train the auditors to behave in all relevant respects. Like they train them with the same script. They train them to be comfortable with silence. They train them to be equally assertive and so on. But notably, they don't train them to wear the same clothes. And in fact, they have interesting documentation of the clothing differences. And implicitly, the idea is, is that the same clothes on different bodies that are perceived to be differently gendered will elicit different reactions. And the idea is that would be a confounder. We don't want that to be a part of the effect, right? That's just, the, you know, and that's fine. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but they should make them wear the same clothes. It's just to identify that that's the implicit understanding of match. It's not to make things truly identical in all respects. It's to also equalize to have the same effect or something like that. And, and the same thing with the mismatch in the NAACP. It's, yes. So I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm oversimplifying this, but to me, the, the whole problem can really be described, the whole implicit matching problem can be described by, you have to some extent, you have interactions between that you're treating as mm -hmm. or something else that you are just not observing. I mean, assume you put some brain scan on these employers in this paper, and you yeah. can see, okay, if there's a white name, and then they, when they actually read the high school, somehow the frontal cortex is not being as engaged or in some different way. Yeah. Then again, you could say, now this is something I can, I, is, no, I can control for. So the real problem is you just have some interaction there that, that you cannot you know, pick out. It, it, yeah, so- Or am I, am I making it something, am I making it so simple? No, no, no. I, I think that you're presupposing with the word interaction that we know what A and B are. And part of the question is what, the A and the B are that are supposedly interacting. Yes. So it seems like you have this very simplified model, which is like, I perceive race, that's A, I perceive education, that's B, and then I perceive productivity level, given that, and that's A mixed with B. Yeah. And part of the challenge is to identify whether that is in fact. Sure, I might not know at all where the interaction is coming from. No, 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 not, not empirically where it's coming from or how to detect it, but rather whether that's an accurate description of the treatment itself, because you might think like part of this is exactly what the debate is about, which is like the treatment is perception of race. And what, what, like, what's that? What's the non-interactive version of that? I see. Yeah. Right. Like, what, like, I think maybe that's the helpful way. Like what's the non-interactive version of just perception of race? Yeah. Is it just like, oh, this person has an ancestry? No, it's not. Right. So it, it must be something thicker than that. And so but before we can say whether it's being interacted or not, I need to know what it is. And, and so we're going to get to that in a second. Yes. 
I was wondering if some, there might be a way for these directional bounds on this. Like I, I might, I'm British, I might say to an American, tell me, uh, is a white high school degree more impressive than a yes. I suspect that black high school degree is more impressive than a white high school degree. They might say, yes, actually, a black high school degree is more impressive. Mm -hmm. And I say, can we still get a bad result for Jamal? Okay, then I kind of don't need to worry anymore about how it's mixed with Jamal and Greg because the confounder that we've quite isolated would only accentuate um, the, the results. So, yeah, so I'm not saying anything normative yet. I'm just saying, co like, causally what's going on. But we, I, I will get to that in, in um in a few slides but those are intimately tied up in this case right so it's kind of weird really really? what what do you want to estimate without the normative framework that's underpinning it yeah, yeah like the taste based discrimination one it's like a well defined one and people don't like it totally so there is a question can i improve my profits with doing something different yes totally i guess what i wanted to say is without putting without um making any statements about directionality yet i i want to just put forth um I guess I haven't gone to the third interpretation, so maybe I'll do the third and then, or young. I just, I, I really like the example with the clothing because I think it shows that just saturating the variables doesn't quite work because exactly. the way exactly. you represent it matters, right? Like mm -hmm. I could represent this as yeah. one of two different things. I could say wearing a skirt. Yes. And then exactly. it would be different. I could also um, featureize it as gender conformal exactly. dress, and then there would be opposite in terms of whether it's similar or not. And it would be a problem of the same thing, which is not intervenable. Like, sorry, not independently manipulable. I can't, it, I can't independently manipulate skirt, female presenting body, and gender conformity. Like, if I change skirt, I, I will change the other one. You know, um, and that was actually, ironically, part of the problem with but for causation, the legal standard for the Bostock and Zarda uh, sex discrimination cases, where the question was, does discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation constitute discrimination on the basis of sex? And they had this exact problem, which was like, well, wait, but if I change your sex then your sexual orientation changes. So maybe I should change your, the sex of your partner. Oh wait, but that would also change, you know, it's like, oh, these things, these three things are relationally defined. Um, and so you can't, um, how you would code it up is just to be fully determined in some, in some sense of whether they are matched or not. That's good, yeah. I mean, it just shows that ethics, covariates and causes are two very different options, right? Yeah, like, exactly. What we would think of as a cause of kind of a change in a distribution of everything at once. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on to the back row. Sometimes with things like researchers are making the additional assumption that the, that the two candidates, once I give you the resumes where they both have high school degrees, that I'm also, in some sense, experimentally instantiating an identical perception in terms of substantive qualifications or productivity. And, and, and here's some, some sentences that sometimes seem to gesture that. The auditor pair are identical in all dimensions that might affect productivity. Okay. Both are determinants of perceived by the firm productivity. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just, it's just, it seems like when I read quotes like this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to equalize the perceived productivity and we're trying to instantiate experimental conditions that will achieve that equality. Yes. Yeah. Although, yeah, it, it's, it's ambiguous. It, exactly. It feels it's a ambiguous. little slippery because, yes. in some sense, I could say perception is a function of these things, totally. and maybe it's perceived differently as a function of race, right? Yes, yes. But here, here, Heckman's clear. He says, once our difficulties arise, right, this is his critique of obviousness, because there are sure to be many unobservable variables, and it's unlikely that all characteristics that might affect productivity will be perfectly matched. And then he says, perceived productivity. And the idea is like, if there is a difference in perceived productivity, that would be a confounder for the effect of race. That's, that's the gist of this quote down here. He's saying that these unobservables and they're affecting the productivity. So you're not matching on productivity. So this is not discrimination. And again, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I think it's pretty clear what my views are, but like, that's not the point. The point is just the ambiguity and the slippage in the language right now. So just to walk through what this one would mean, the interpretation here is I read the name, I perceive why, but now I read, when I read education, I read, I perceive that the candidate has some specific level of qualification or merit irrespective of racialized status, right? Because I need to equalize productivity level or human capital. So if, if you make the additional assumption that the similarities in the formal credentials bring about similarity in the corresponding perceptions of qualifications, then it does seem justified to write the notation like this. Insofar as B and HSD are tracking perception of race, perception of 
qualifications or something. Um, here it seems like number three is, you know, you can, you know, this is like a test. What do you guys think? Because if the only thing that changes in an observer's mind upon examining a resume with a distinctively black sound name is the belief that the person to whom the resume refers is black. So that one I think is like kind of that is not, yeah, this guy is the dean of um, Yale Management School. Um, uh, so, he, and this is a this is a paper on um, discrimination studies. So, you know. Oh, we have some more. Uh, basically, it's the same thing, like a similar ambiguity, similar in regards of what, similar in regards of the formal credentials, in regards of perceived, whatever. Okay, so implications, and then um, yeah, we're, we're shortening the talks today. So if the SMN is the mixed treatment, either in the form that Isaiah proffered or in this other form, totally fine. But notice that what we're saying is that the effect is not disentangling the perception of race from the perception of credentials, right? So the candidates are not perceived to be, unlike the Kerwin Charles article, they're not perceived to be only different in race and perceived in different in qualifications. They might be perceived to be different in both, right? And you might say that's a part of the effect. We wanna swoop that into the effect. It's a difference in race, which contains within it a difference in qualifications or something like that. Yeah, but it, I think it's still important to put out, right, that both differences are imposed by a perception of difference in race. Yes, totally. Well. Yeah, yes. So even the education child, it's not like I perceive that person differently because they're the third, the fourth letter in their first yes, name. Yes, totally. Yes. And, and this gets to a, a general ambiguity, which is I have no problem with that. And it just means that the perception of race is more expansive than just like I, I, I think that the person to whom the resume belongs is black. It's more expansive. It includes also, and I perceive this person to have had worse education, and I perceive this person to be less prepared for being for this position in my firm. It just means that the perception treatment is more expansive than um than the previous like line would suggest. Yes. And I think relatedly, I mean it sort of it comes a little bit to related to something Jan said earlier, right? It whether we call this as discrimination, yeah. whether, right, whether we sort of call this evidence of sort of but for discrimination, yes. it's sort of very relevant, but for what? Exactly. Right? Because for, if I'm saying sort of this person would have sort of holding this person's educational credentials as stated on their resume fixed, this yes. person would have been hired, but for their race. Yes. You sort of can substantiate that. Yes. The thing you can't substantiate is this person would have holding the perception of this person's educational qualification yes. or productivity fix, this person Absolutely. would have been hired. And in some sense- conditioning on? Right, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a theme. Yes, um, yes. And, and in some sense, maybe, I guess I would, the first seems pretty defensible. I mean, I guess there's a, it, it's sort of not what the Becker model would bring you to. Yes. So I agree. I totally agree with you that it sort of is not the Becker version, but it sort of. Yeah, yes, totally. But the, and I'll, I'll get to this in a bit, but the idea is like, it's a normative baseline that you're setting, <laughs> and and it just needs to be clear that that's the normative baseline. Yeah. But I'll say more about that. Yes. I, I think like in order to understand what's going on here, it feels yeah. to me like thinking a little bit about kind of the intellectual history it comes yeah. from yeah. It tells us a lot. And, and my and kind of made up version of that would be something like you have the civil rights movement that says there's all this racial inequality. Yeah. It's discrimination. Yeah. And then along come Becker and Cohen say no, it's not discrimination because it's justified because the market. Yeah. Right. And yes. And so they come up with this notion of this discrimination as deviation from profit maximization. Totally. And then there's different ways of trying to empirically operationalize that. The audit studies have won. Yeah. And then there are the people who continue in this audit study tradition and to some extent even forget where the, the original motivation of the libertarian framework just came from. Yeah. But the, this history is kind of in the background. And so then maybe some confusions arise because these roots are not not very evident. Yeah. yeah, and I and I think that this is even evidence in a lot of you. And I've read like all. I'm like addicted to studies. So like, like my nighttime reading. Like I want to read the nature. I love it. But um, oftentimes, like audit studies, they'll they'll say we don't know whether this comes from taste based or statistical, or they'll say we did this other thing which shows that it might be statistical. So so they have in mind this distinction between taste base and statistical, but they themselves are oftentimes not clear about what their study is trying to do. Um, and- It's something that happens very often in the history of science, right? <laughs> if somebody starts something that's 
no. out from a certain point, and then people follow in their footsteps, forget but, about very painful. But in this case, it seems like it's not like the authors are don't know about it. So they are. They do. They're like referencing it in their paper. They're like using. They know about that first model. It, it just seems that they're not. I think it's. Be, I honestly do think that um, it's because this is not a lot of clarity about what similarity and difference are meant to be tracking here, and. That, that's why I kind of wanted to impose the potential outcome, the notation, the notation kind of brings it out more clearly. Um, but it's very mud, muddied. And, and, and in fact, I think that it, it's this, which is that you think that there's a, there's a way you should be responding to a high school degree. <laughs> that's what I call HSD norm. Like you should be like, come on, like they have the same degree. That's like basically the thought. You should, tr you should perceive them the same. Whether you are, is, is a separate matter, but part of what makes it a study of discrimination is that I'm measuring deviation from what I think you should be doing. And that's, I think, the real notion of similarity. They're similar, but for race in the sense that they should be treated the same in the way that like Aristotle said, they're like in the sense that they are owed equal treatment or something like that. Not that they are in fact the same, in fact, perceived to be the same. So I think it's something like this. You have like WHSD norm, <laughs> BHSD norm, which is where HSD norm is the, the normative stand, like the kind of the treatment that I, or sorry, the perception of qualifications that you should have in a world like ours and when you receive in conditions like so. Um, so this means that if you think of it this way, which is that there's, it's just a normative baseline of how people ought to be treated. And that's what, that's what rationalizes the audit study design, not the fact that there are perceived in a certain way. Um, then it seems, then, um, a lot of the methodological critiques about, oh, you didn't control for blah. It's like, no, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if I didn't control that. that. I, these people should be treated the same. I shouldn't have to give you more information to justify them. Like, it's just not opposite. It's just not um, relevant, right? Um, and so I think that that's really important because, you know, we're all about assumptions over here. So it should be clear about what the normative assumptions are so that we don't confuse our methodological disagreements with our normative disagreements. Like, I should be able to say to Gary Becker, it doesn't matter if their unobservables are different. This is enough because it's a study of racial discrimination. <laughs> yes. But, but then it's you you make a the moral judgments in deciding what details are put on the CV totally. accompanying the name. Absolutely. What detail level of detail to go to. Absolutely. Um, and which salient. Yes, absolutely. Right. And so notice, you know, if I ran, I, oh, I say this as a joke, but it's like. If Greg and Jamal had different favorite colors, if they if they had different favorite kinds of food, that wouldn't license a difference. You know, if, if someone said, wait, no, but like, you know, Greg really likes mayonnaise or something, I wouldn't be like, what? That difference is irrelevant. What do I mean? It's normatively irrelevant, even if like- the, the big or Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Well, because I'm saying so, right? Like I'm the experiment. So, but like, I, well, I guess the, the point is, is that the resume study compels us because it's a widely shared moral view that we have, which is that people who have the same resumes, at least in conditions like that, Jamal should not be getting fewer callbacks. But if the resumes were like, here are Greg and Jamal, they both like hot dogs, <laughs> then you wouldn't be like, oh, it's such a travesty that it wouldn't, it wouldn't compel the same kind of um, intuition that something discriminatory has happened. It's because we have a widely shared moral view that these people are substantively similar, that we interpret deviations from equal callbacks as discriminatory, not because we've done the causal sorting. Yes. So can we imagine um, Pearl uh, kind of creating a version of his directed graphs, which is kind of moral, uh, analog to the descriptive DAG? Like, uh, can we imagine him? I guess I'm saying, um, what you keep on, what you keep off the resume is really important. Then you might start theorizing, you might even start drawing directed graphs. In it. Yeah, so what should have a line? What should have a line to what? What should not? Like, just a proposal. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I always. I've said this to you all before, but I, I read a DAG and I I feel like I'm about to black out because I do not know what they mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, strictly speaking, an honest study, like, suppose my outcome is Y. An honest study, strictly speaking, like, I, 
I don't care about what the arrows are going into what. I mean, right? Like, I'm just creating an odyssey. Like, I don't, why, why do I need like the flow through time? I just need like the direct entries into why. So I don't actually need the complicated stuff. Now, perhaps the dad can guide us in thinking about what should be on the resume. Maybe that's your thought. Like, if I draw a dagger, it can help me kind of, you know. Yeah, that was, that was my thought. Okay, yeah. okay. What should be in the moral, in the I moral see. sense right. that you were just I see. To because, display. so like the one thing I want to say is like the methodological like upshot of this is that we can run odysseys and, and get this. We can write different things on the resumes and it could still be a study of discrimination. You know what I mean? Because it, once we realize that it's not a matter of match similarity in perception or similarity on the page, but instead a normative standard of similarity, then there's nothing that prevents our normative standard of similarity to require different things on the resume. So we can run their you know, heterodox audit studies where we compare Greg and Jamal, but they have different things on the resume. And we say, nevertheless, they deserve equal treatment. And to me, that's what I think like the lesson of affirmative action is, just like that, which is like, yeah, resumes look different. They should still get the same kind of treatment. Or, you know, resumes look different. That doesn't mean that like, huge gaps in admissions rates are justified. Yeah. Yes. So I, in part, I, I agree with, with you, but then don't you run into this problem that it, you kind of, you shifted away from the discussion about are your assumptions met here and, and are you controlling for the confounds there might be, but there's just, I just don't agree with you. I don't agree with your normative, you know, what should be considered the same and therefore the cognitive effect that you find is one that I don't agree with. But the reality is, is that I think people are having that. The, the reality is, I, honestly, this is just like my interpretation of methodological debate. They are having that debate. They just are pretending that they're having this other debate. They, they like when you look at the kind of econometrician briefs in the Harvard case, when they say like, you shouldn't control for that because of the minute variable bias, you shouldn't control for that. Like, I think here's a straightforward way. Um, you should not account for parental professional status. Not because it's confounding, but because you shouldn't. That shouldn't matter. That's not a justified reason for admitting people differently. When they say you shouldn't control, you shouldn't have legacies, they're saying legacies shouldn't be in the pool for a normative reason, not for a statistical hygiene reason. So, but this has become completely muddied. So I think that what you're pointing out is exactly the problem here, which is that people are having normative disputes about what the correct estimate is but it's framed as methodological disputes about controlling for confounders. And that has made a lot of things very confusing. So you're just saying, let's just be honest about that cause and inference at this point isn't always wrong. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, in cases like this, I think that that, I mean, how are the hired hands like happening to find, well, you know? Well, I, I, I don't wanna see. <laughs> Isaiah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, right, in some sense, right, sort of, can I not flip that on its head a little bit, yeah. though, and in some sense basically say, like, for thinking about causality, it's basic, for, or at least certainly in this audit study context, it's enough for us to do the audit, one, the blob one, blob two version, and then we just, we, and then the whole fight should be about what's in the blobs, right? And basically what blobs, like, what class of blobs do we think should be equivalent, and what yeah, class good. of blobs do we think are sort yeah. of morally, it is allowable for them to be treated differently? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that would be uh, uh, that would be an intervention in the way that we do audit studies and the way we talk about things that I would I would sign on to as a significant improvement. Just as a matter of fact, in terms of how they do it, that's not right. yeah, making no. all sorts of like uneven assumptions. Yeah. Though I, I have to say, it's not just the case in audit studies. So just to really quickly generalize the point, like uh, many of you might be familiar with, for instance, and I've read about this Friar's work on the effective race on police use of force, which has generated this whole like sub like sub 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 literature of people responding to that and other people responding to their response to that. And it's a similar thing. It's not, it's not as clear because it's an observational study, but he's basically trying to look at whether there's differential uses of force by police. He looks at a range of outcomes based on race. And then people are like, no, you're not account adjusting for da 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 da. Or like you're adjusting for a perceived level of suspicion, but you shouldn't adjust for that. And it's just like it's a norm, you know. Like why, why shouldn't it, because it doesn't like, because, because police don't react according to their perceived level of threat. Of course they do. Of course that that's behaviorally affects a police officer's reaction in, a, in an action situation. But the, the response is a normative one, which is like, 
Given what we know about how police react to people, racially speaking, we should not condition on that. Like it, that, that's not justified, right? So that's a normative debate too. And, and that's a huge part of the, the debate about the use of data and whether um, police reports should be, or should count as a part of the um, code itself. set, yeah. And just, I guess there's a whole other set of implicit normative assumptions that we haven't touched at all, which is what the policy space is. Right, so, you can, so you can discuss about the exact admissions guidelines and how you deal with legacy and yeah, it's uh, gonna affect like people. Good, should we increase the number yes. of the students tenfold or should yes. we shift money to community colleges? Absolutely. Which would have much bigger equity implications, maybe. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and and that's a really good point because that's exactly if you guys have read the causality textbook. Pearl intervenes in the Berkeley sex discrimination case, which is this case that famously is an illustration of Simpson's paradox, where you have university-wide, you have these sex disparities in graduate admissions that are reversed at the departmental level. So it looks like at the graduate, at the entire university level, it looks like there's discrimination in favor or discrimination against female applicants, but at a department level, it looks like there's discrimination in favor of them. Um, and so it's a classic Simpsons paradox. And then so Pearl is like, oh, I'm going to draw this dag, and that's going to like reveal that there is or is not discrimination. And so this is actually the dag that he draws. But to Max's point, it's exactly this like mystification because the actual explanation is that, you know, as everyone agrees on, is that women apply to more competitive programs, and that's why they're accepted at lower numbers. But that restricts the policy because Max used to be like, yeah, we should fund nursing more, we should fund social work more, we, or we should fund English more, we should fund the departments that are more competitive, i.e. give them more slots, and that should be considered in the suite of policies to address the problem rather than like blinding applications or something like that. So I, I do think that these DAGs do have this additional, um, they control the space of thinking about the policy, the set of policy solutions um, by trying to isolate like, oh, this is the department's contribution and so on. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of puzzling things have that effect. So, all right. Thank you guys. I don't know why I'm going to the thank you slide to officially thank you guys. <laughs> uh, but anyway, voila. <laughs>